Ah, so yes, work-life balance and mindfulness, different names, same aims. <clears throat> this talk came about because I read an article in the Huffington Post and it posed that particular question. It was, is mindfulness the new way to talk about work-life balance? And I thought that was an interesting question, so I explored the topic further. Um, I really do enjoy the whole sort of work-life balance, mindfulness, being more organised, that sort of topic. Uh, so this is what we're going to cover. So what is work-life balance? What is mindfulness? Is your life actually balanced? And how we can improve work-life balance? Before we get started, I do have a question for you. Um, if you don't have paper, we actually have some paper up here and pens. And what we'd like you to do is just think about what you do for fun. <laughs> Very broad question. Uh, we'd just like you to brainstorm that for a um, uh, couple of minutes even. We'll just see how far we get. Okay, so you might want to think about that for <coughs> during the course of the seminar. Um, you're wondering what the po point of this is. We're actually not going to tell you until the very end. <laughs> but there is a point, I promise. <laughs> So our next question is, are work-life balance and mindfulness the same? So Tamsin over there is going to write your definitions of work-life balance and mindfulness. So if you just want to shout out what you think work-life balance might be, how would you define it? Is it having control? Anyone else? Yep. Um, don't think about work after work. Okay. <laughs> Someone else had their hand up. Yep. Okay. So boundaries between work and home. Any other definitions? Anyone got something a little bit different? about just feeling comfortable um, within yourself around the balance of your Ah. Lack of stress? Lack of stress? Mm-hmm. Lack of stress entirely or...? Well, no, just yourself, that you're not stressed about working too much or working enough. Okay, so you feel comfortable yeah. with, with the so balance? And yeah, a bit of lack of stress though. Yeah. Can be too much stress. Being able to drive your own personal agenda and not just only doing what work is required. So do your personal priorities? Yes. Yeah. So finances, mm -hmm. life, family, you know, relationships. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what about mindfulness? How would you define that? Being present. Being aware of all five senses. Yeah, aware of all five senses. What else? Anything else? Be where your feet are. Oh, I like that. <laughs> Sorry, I missed that. Be where your feet are. Be where your feet are. I really like that. <laughs> <laughs> It struck a chord, obviously. <laughs> Anything else? I think that encapsulates it. Awesome. Um, do we think then that work-life balance and mindfulness are the same? No? no? Okay. <laughs> 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 there is an overlap, isn't there? And we will explore that tonight. I covered all my bases there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what is work-life balance? So what it isn't, and I think actually it's already been um, talked about, it's not equal. Um, there's not equal balance. Uh, it's not like you have to get a perfect score of five for every single aspect of your life. It might even change daily. It can vary over time, even daily, in terms of sort of that balance for you. 
and then there's no perfect one size fits all. So what I think is good work-life balance in Tamsin um, would change for Natalie, for example. So, what is it? Meaningful daily achievement and enjoyment in each of my four life quadrants, work, family, friends, and self. And I think some of those definitions mm. were heading in that direction. Okay. So, I guess the question is, do you feel like your life is actually balanced? Ta-da! We're going to get you to do another exercise. And this is what you will be doing. Um, so this is a wheel of life. So what we actually want you to do, so on this one you can see in the middle there is zero, then we've got five and then we've got ten. And this person has decided that their sort of roles in the areas of their life, a sports player, team member, colleague, manager, mother, father, don't know how they can be both, <laughs> partner, health, career, work, friend and community leader. And so we actually want you to have a go at doing this yourselves. Yeah. So really what you need to do is to look at uh, roles or areas. So roles it might be, the, the, yes, you might be a partner, you might be just your individual, you might be a brother or a sister. So think about those roles. Then think about the broader areas. Could be career, could be education, could be family. Think about the areas, but, and it can be a, a combination of both of those, but think about what's most important to you. Think about your own personal values, because your combination is actually going to re reflect your personal priorities in life and your values. <coughs> then, um, think about the amount of attention that you're actually allocating to each area. Uh, and and as, as Peter said, uh, the, the values a scale of 0 to 10, 0 being lowest, 10 being highest. And looking back again to this, 10s um, uh, are on the outside, 5s in the, the mid and 0 in the, uh, right in the centre there. Once you've marked the scores for, uh, for each of those, then join it up. Uh, so again, I'll, I'll just flip back. So you get it joined up like that. Once you've done it for your, um, uh, your current present, present tense, then um, think, think about your ideal levels. And what we want you to do is to have two different uh, sets of scores, one for where you feel you are currently and what your ideal level is. And I won't give you any more instructions because that's enough for now. So I'm going to flip back to this so you can get a sense of, uh, of this again. So that could be your present and then we'll get you to do another one for what your desired, your ideal is. <coughs> it's an individual exercise, but you can talk to the person next door to you if you wish, just to get some ideas. So most of you have got to the action stage, I think. Um, so you're considering what actions you might take to gain balance. That Huffington Post article I was talking about actually asks the question whose responsibility it is. So if you have a look at those actions, are they your responsibility or is it someone else's responsibility? So work-life balance, we usually actually talk about our employer. Uh, we do a survey of students and ask them what they most want from an employer, what would um, entice them to actually take a job, and work-life balance comes up a lot, as though it's the employer's responsibility. <laughs> yeah. Um, or is, so is it theirs or is it ours? <coughs> it is true that an organisation and the organisation's culture can definitely affect work-life balance, but we also have to take some responsibility ourselves. Um, so aligning your priorities in life um, and your values with your work. Also setting and communicating boundaries, which is really, really difficult. <laughs> And then there's the whole managing stress. So before, when we were talking about definitions, stress came up. 
and then the whole pay attention to what you're doing while you're doing it. So that those last two in particular might sound similar to mindfulness. So that brings us to the definition of mindfulness. Mindfulness is paying attention to the present moment with openness, curiosity and without judgment. And I think that that's what we were talking about on there. So it's uh, being present, aware of all five senses, be where your feet are. So I think that fits really nicely in with that particular definition. There's two parts to mindfulness. So it's actually learning to focus attention on one thing and being able to bring the attention back when your mind gets distracted. A mind is very, very easily distracted and the whole thing with mindfulness is actually um, being able to bring it back. So it's like your brain's a muscle and every time you bring it back, you're actually getting better at mindfulness and more focus and attention. And then also it's the attitude though, it's that attitude of being open and being curious, um, being able to pay attention, open, non-judging and curious about what you're focusing on. So it's both of those things. Mindlessness is the opposite of mindfulness. So I'm sure we've all had that experience, frightening to think, but you're driving, you get home, you have no idea how you actually got there. <laughs> <laughs> or you have no idea if all those lights were green that you drove through. Um, and then there's also that one work one, eating lunch at your desk. That might be a conscious choice. Uh, is your employer making you or is it your choice and is it your responsibility to do that or not do that? So they're examples of state of automatic pilot and we go through life a lot on automatic pilot. We were going um, through the motions in our mind and we're disconnected from our body. I went to the gym before and I was actually thinking about tonight's presentation and so when we were supposed to skip machines I was still thinking about tonight and I kept going on that one particular machine. I was an automatic pilot, which is actually really good when you're in the gym. But <laughs> <laughs> so who's responsible for the mindfulness? So with work-life balance we think it's both of us. Um, some would argue, and in that Huffington Post article, he certainly did, that it's personal responsibility. That it starts with personal responsibility and then radiates out to your colleagues and your family, your relationships. But if we go back to those choices, so those first two in particular, you really need self-awareness, and those last two, I think it's sort of definitely mindfulness. But there's a lot of overlap. If it is an individual responsibility, how come all these organisations are now mindful organisations? Uh, and these are just a small sample. Mindfulness is definitely infiltrating work. Um, Counties Manica Health, um, Auckland District Health Board, EY, Zero, Callaghan Innovation, and then we've got places like Apple, Google, um, UK Government. They're becoming more mindful as well. So there must be some benefits. And it, once again, work-life balance and mindfulness, it looks like it's the responsibility of us, but also the organisation and its culture. Sorry, what, what constitutes a mindful organisation? Uh, I think I will answer that question, but if I don't, <laughs> yeah. You may have heard this word mindfulness. It's become something of a buzz phrase of late. But I'm going to give you one simple serviceable definition, which is this. Mindfulness is the ability to know what's happening in your head at any given moment without getting carried away by it. Imagine how useful this could be. Just as an example, driving down the road and somebody cuts you off in traffic. How do you normally react? I think most of us, we normally react by having a thought, which is, I'm pissed. And then what happens next? You immediately, habitually, reflexively inhabit that thought. You actually become pissed. There's no buffer between the stimulus and your reaction. With just a little bit of mindfulness, in that same situation, 
you might notice my chest is buzzing. My ears are turning red. I'm having a starburst of self-righteous thoughts. I'm getting angry. But you don't necessarily have to act on it and chase that person down the road, screaming at them with your kids in the back of the car thinking you've gone nuts. <laughs> now, you might be thinking, don't I need to get angry sometimes? Aren't I justified? I would say yes, but probably not as much as you think. The proposition here is not that you should be rendered by mindfulness into some lifeless, non-judgmental blob. The proposition is that you should learn how to respond wisely to things that happen to you, rather than just reacting blindly. And that, my friends, is a superpower. How do you get it? The way to get it is through meditation. I believe that meditation and mindfulness are the next big public health revolution. In the 1940s, if you told somebody you were going running, they would have said, who's chasing you? But then what happened next? The scientists swooped in. They showed that physical exercise is really good for you. And now all of us do it. And if we don't, we feel guilty about it. And that's where I think we're headed with mindfulness and meditation. It's going to join the pantheon of no-brainers like brushing your teeth, eating well, and taking the meds your doctor prescribed for you. Let me just close by saying, <laughs> mindfulness is not going to solve all of your problems. It's not going to render your life a nonstop parade of unicorns and rainbows. Nonetheless, this is a superpower and one that is accessible by you immediately. Um, so I've got a link at the end, but those, that video and, and another one I will show you later are all on the University Health and Wellness page. Um, so the benefits of mindfulness. So it's a tool, it can help you reduce worries, anxiety, stress, give you more energy, sense of calm, sort of sounds too good to be true really, doesn't it? Um, help you learn to relax, regulate your emotions, creativity enhance awareness, improve concentration, productivity, develop a sense of empathy and connectedness and enjoy better health and sleep. So they actually have done brain scans and have found physical changes in people's brains when they practice mindfulness on a regular basis. In terms of sort of like what a mindful organisation might look like, it depends on the organisation. Some of this would embrace this wholeheartedly. In a little while I'll get on to sort of meditation and whether that's mindfulness. Um, so some regular meditation, others it's an optional program. Um, so it looks different in different places. But they are certainly embracing, some of the organisations are really br embracing this. Just the same as they're embracing other sort of elements of health and safety. And in Auckland District Health Board, I've personally experienced the fact that they're giving out mindfulness as a prescription. Uh, I have a, a bit of an issue with um, blood pressure when I go in for, uh, I get white coat syndrome essentially. Uh, and I was going in for surgery earlier this year and they, I said, how can I, how can I avoid just about being um, turned down for surgery like happened to me previously? They gave me a mindfulness meditation. Uh, I was still stressed when I went to the surgery, but my blood pressure was not crazy high, it was just a little high. And so I, I said to the anaesthetist, and, uh, and she said, yeah, thank goodness, because we had all notes about what you were going to be like. And um, they, now they, they suggest so many people uh, do that, and they are seeing the benefits across the, um, uh, across the operating uh, theatres uh, invisibly. So, so yeah, I thought it was a load of tosh, frank, frankly, before I did this, but now I actually do, but I'm a believer. <laughs> <laughs> and that leads me beautifully into the science of it. Um, I'm glad you laughed at the last video. This one, I can't say it's a funny video, but I think it's very motivational. My name is uh, Associate Professor Craig Hassett and I work at Monash University, based originally in the Department of General Practice. Mindfulness is very simple. It has to do with paying attention to the present moment, to our life as it unfolds, but also cultivating an attitude with which we pay attention. Researchers and psychologists start to adapt mindfulness to help people with um, chronic and relapsing depression. And when those studies started to come out showing major reductions in relapse rates, um, other people start to take it seriously and, 
and literally on the back of the research, it's, um, it's just gone up exponentially since the early 2000s. To the point that, say, last year alone, 2016, um, there were just under 700 um, new papers published in refereed medical and psychological journals. One of the interesting things and the challenging thing for people to understand is how mindfulness can have profound effects on our physical health. Now, to understand that, we need to understand a little bit about the fight or flight response. So for a short period of time, we're faster and we're stronger and we'll have more endurance than we normally have. Now, the unfortunate thing is that when we're not mindful, we often activate that response when we don't really need it. So one of the people to really put this on the map, the, uh, the chronic effect of this overactivation of the response was McEwen. And he described what he called allostatic load, physiological wear and tear, like flogging the car day in, day out. And that's associated with uh, a poor immune function. We get less defense against coughs, colds, infections, we're more likely to get sick during periods of high stress, or we get more inflammation. The technical term is immune dysregulation. Um, it, metabolic effects, blood pressure, blood glucose, blood lipids um, are out of whack. Um, uh, it thins our bones. Um, it um, increases the rate of um, atherosclerosis, the hardening of the arteries that leads to heart attacks and strokes and so on. If we want to accelerate aging, this is how to do it. But it damages the brain as well. So these stress chemicals day in, day out, damage areas that are very important, like the hippocampus, so that's our learning and memory center of the brain, and the prefrontal cortex, so that's working memory and executive function. These are our higher functions. And damaging those areas of the brain is not what we want to do. The effects of this high activation of the stress response and so on, the psychological, emotional stress, has even been um, found to go right down to the DNA of our cells. And so Elizabeth Blackburn, an Australian woman who won the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 2009 for discovering telomeres, she and her team, um, Eliza Apple, um, particularly uh, prominent among her team, um, have found that um, overactivating this response uh, accelerates the um, aging process as measured by DNA um, in terms of telomere length. So we can be about a decade older by middle age if we've got high levels of anger and hostility and stress and, and so on compared to somebody who might have the same situation in life but is getting less stressed and reactive over them. The interesting thing is when we practice being more mindful then it switches off these dif distracted default circuits. It engages the sensory areas and the attention centers of the brain. And when we're sitting down practicing mindfulness meditation, those centers in our brain are getting a workout. And it's like they're going to the gym, right? <laughs> they're lifting some weights, but they're on the treadmill. It starts to have a whole range of positive effects on the health. So we get immune regulation. So better immunity, we're less likely to get sick with coughs, colds, infections, switches off, excessive inflammation. Uh, takes stress off the cardiovascular system, switches down cortisol, all the damage that it has on the bones. Elizabeth Blackburn and her team have been doing work on that in a whole series of studies that started, the first one published in 2009, that showed that mindfulness switched on the repair enzyme uh, called telomerase and has been found to slow down the rate of aging down to the DNA of the cells. If that was a drug, that would be a blockbuster drug. So not so happy, but definitely motivational, I think. Yeah. <laughs> um, so they talked in both of those videos about meditation. Uh, and I used to, I went to the Sri Shrim Noi Centre, this is years ago, to learn how to meditate. And I felt like an utter failure, because I kept thinking about having what I was going to do afterwards, um, having to pick up dinner, et cetera, et cetera, instead of focusing on the rows that we were supposed to be focusing on. <laughs> so I always thought I couldn't do meditation. Failure. Uh, and then I discovered this video, and also uh, there's an app called Headspace. There's also the Smiling Mind app, which I've got links to in the presentation at the end for you. And I listened to the app and I watched this video and I thought, ah, I was actually doing it right all along. I just didn't realize. Despite what you may have heard, meditation does not involve 
joining a group, paying any fees, wearing any special outfits, sitting in a funny position, or believing in anything in particular. <laughs> it is simple, secular, scientifically validated exercise for your brain. You don't have to do it yet, but just so you know, here are the three steps. One, sit with your back straight and your eyes closed. Two, notice the feeling of your breath coming in and going out. Pick a spot where it's most prominent. Usually that's your nose or your chest or your belly. And just focus your full attention on the feeling of your breath coming in and going out. Now, as soon as you try to do this, your mind's going to go nuts. You're going to start thinking about, what am I going to have for lunch? Why did I say that dumb thing to my boss? Your brain's going to go nuts, and that's fine. The whole game is to notice when you've gotten lost and to start over, and then to start over again and again and again. Every time you do that, it's like a bicep curl for your brain, and it shows up on the brain scan. Scientists have found this in the lab. It's also, by the way, a radical act. You're breaking a lifetime's habit of walking around in a fog of projection and rumination, and you're actually focusing on what's happening right now. Meditation is unlike anything you do in the rest of your life. Failure is actually success. As I said, the whole game is just trying, failing, starting again, failing, starting again. Here's my advice. You should be meditating every day five to 10 minutes a day, that's it. This doesn't require some giant investment. I don't care how busy you are, you have five to 10 minutes to give this a shot. I guarantee you it will make a big difference. If you find yourself slipping and not able to do that, I think all you need to do is look at that science video again. Every time I watch it, it kind of freaks me out a little bit. <laughs> Oops, so. Um, so is mindfulness just meditation? So not everyone wants to meditate, and so do you have to meditate? And is that the only way to be mindful? Um, meditation is the formal practice of it. But there's also informal mindfulness as well. So meditation, formal practice, we meditate to strengthen our mindfulness skills. So that's what that does. But there's informal ways of doing it too. Walking, running, cooking, eating. I was having coffee with a friend um, on Monday and um, at the cafe, besides the coffee, you know, sometimes they have those little cookies or a chocolate covered bean or whatever it is. And this was, um, was actually apricot and it was really nice. So we were talking and then I um, had it and I was eating it and I was enjoying the flavors and she was chatting to me and she picked up the little apricot thing and she ate it, but she was still talking. She didn't taste it at all. Um, so mindful eating is actually really tasting it, enjoying it, um, savoring it, and it's just being aware of the textures and everything else. And yes, I heard a, uh, a life coach uh, who is actually a trained psychologist uh, speak and he does executive coaching for extremely high-powered executives. And one of the things he does is he goes out to dinner with them, but they can't speak. Yeah. Neither of them right. speak. They have to just focus on the, um, uh, on the meal. And so for 15, 20 minutes, they just sit there silently eating their meal. Then at the end of the meal, uh, he actually discusses and, and the, the revelations that people get through that of what food tastes like, of what, what actually they can think about while they're eating. Uh, he said that some people it's, it's, it's a really, it's a bit a radical act just eating because they're actually putting their full body and mind into it. And there's also such thing as walking meditation as well, or walking mindfulness, which is pretty much what it sounds like. Instead of um, just walking along and listening to your music, it's actually when you're walking, it's feeling the ground beneath your feet. It's p playing attention to the wind on your face or the sunshine, and actually noticing your surroundings. Tamsin and I did it in Albert Park. And the things that we saw in that park that we'd never noticed before. <laughs> no, not like that. <laughs> but there was a bit of that, but. <laughs> well, yeah, student, yeah, okay, we won't go there. <laughs> but things like birds, <laughs> um, and yeah, the blossoms, and even just the trunks, the tree and the bark on the trees and the patterns it formed. 
was stuff that we'd never noticed. And the stuff we heard too, uh, because we heard stuff outside the park, so the traffic, there were, there were bells, I think there was, there was a, t a clock tower going, uh, stuff that usually you just, you just tune out, but actually that we, we were really heard all sorts of stuff that was just sort of, it was mind-blowing experience, wasn't mm. it? Yeah. Uh, so it doesn't have to be that formal meditation. It could be that. And I actually know a student who, um, instead of sort of like doing five, ten minutes a day, he actually, when he's studying and if he's uh, doing an assignment and he starts feeling a bit stressed, he'll just stop and just focus on his breathing for a few minutes. And then he'll get started again. So there's lots of different ways of doing it. Yeah, the playing the music one, another thing that you can do, and this is a really good stress one, is sing silently to yourself, but visualise the words as well as what you're singing, and visualise the spelling of the words and the shape of the words. And all of a sudden you're concentrating so much on the, the visualisation that you actually, the stress is, starts to go away because you're really, really uh, you're f f getting into the nitty gritty of the shape of the words and those sorts of things. So there's all sorts of different little tools that you can use uh, to, to reduce your stress and be, be a mi much more mindful person. So that list that we had you have a look at at the beginning, um, if you have a look at that list now and just think about whether some of those can be mindful activities. And then the other thing, Tamsin is um, giving you a handout and you might be able to find some of those activities on that handout. And that handout will actually tell you what type of addict you are. So just as an example, I was talking about clearing out clutter. So that means I'm getting the serotonin hit when I do that. Or I was talking about um, my to-do list. That means I'm getting a hit of dopamine. Does anyone want to share what they're addicted to? You might find that there's sort of like, in terms of that list, maybe you're, um, it's more of the serotonin activities or the dopamine activities. You will see some crossover. Uh, so exercise features in a number of different areas. <laughs> I'm so stoked that I ticked three of the boxes just by something like going to the gym. <laughs> if you're wondering about coffee, it's endorphins and dopamine. And what you're sort of doing with those sorts of activities is it's activating the parasympathetic nervous system. So it's empathy. Empathy increases, your tolerance increases, um, wider perception, improve your immunity. It sounds very much like mindfulness, really. It helps your cells repair and rejuvenate, relaxes your muscles, slows your heart rate, slower and calmer lungs, improves your digestion, and even decreases blood pressure. So all of those sort of activities and the different chemicals that they release, within moderation, <laughs> um, some of those could become addictions. Anyone want to share their list? <laughs> yeah? Um, I'm a real match between the serotonin and oxytocin. Mm -hmm. The hugs and the sharing a meal and the, and the people mm. oriented things. Mm. I'm a mix between the serotonin and the dopamine. But there's elements of the others in there as well. Anyone else? And a lot of these, when you look at it, whether it's the exercise, whether it's hugging, whether it's sharing a meal, all of those things can be done mindfully. So then that would increase the p pleasure and increase the hit of chemicals that you would be getting. No, there's no there one isn't that one that's know. better, and we're all a mix. And as I said, there's some crossover, so like exercise comes in there in a number of different ways. But we are getting chemicals in ways we didn't realise. So if you go to a cafe and you're surrounded by people, you get a chemical release. So that's why people go to um, work in cafes, 
and they find their productivity increases. Even if it's a total, they don't talk to anyone, they're on their own. We're actually getting chemicals. We're just addicts, basically. <laughs> we just don't realise. And social media, don't get me started on social media. <laughs> um, main, mainly dopamine. Yes. Yeah, so if you get a like, um, so you go and click, uh, check your Facebook and you, someone likes or makes a comment. Uh, and it also, some of them manipulate you, like LinkedIn, to actually complete the profile, because we love to complete things. <laughs> Dopamine. So if, for example, you have a dinner party with friends, mm -hmm. how do you do that mindfully? It's been in the present moment, and it's not thinking about what you're doing the next day. It's being present with your friends, enjoying it, not worrying about whether the souffle is going to collapse or not, but actually, <laughs> <laughs> but actually, you know, sort of like being present with your friends and designing it in a way that you don't have to worry about those sorts of things. So it's being where your feet are. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> and it's also not having your phone on. It's yeah, not. It's so. It's like it's that. those sorts of things as well. It's being actually in the moment. So we were at a um, restaurant the other night, and besides wonderful food, they also had really nice cocktails. <coughs> and we enjoyed ours, and then we saw one being served that was in a tube, and it was blue, and it just looked fantastic. It was about this tall. And the person that it was put in front of was on her phone. We were looking at it in marvel, and she was on her phone. And even when she did look up, I'd, I never saw her smile or notice it at all. And these weren't ex um, cheap cocktails either. Um, and I just, yeah, I couldn't get over that. She definitely wasn't mindful. Okay, okay so we started with our work balance and mindfulness the same. And the answer is, we came up with a new definition. <laughs> Hopefully we'll show. We combined the two. Kind of <laughs> cheated. <laughs> um, so we do, so these resources, the PowerPoint will be sent out to you. So we do have um, some resources for you. So uh, the University Health and Counselling, that's where um, those happy <coughs> videos were. Uh, the Not So Happy video is on the Smiling Mind website, and there's actually an app that you can download which is free. Uh, I think it was originally designed for students, but now it's for all different age groups. They've got different sort of a range of ages. The Headspace app is, there's a 10 uh, day free course, but then you've got to pay for it. Uh, Ministry of Business Innovation Employment has a little bit about work-life balance and the benefits for employers and employees. And then the article that kind of made us all th think about this workshop is the Huffington Post one down the bottom. Um, because I do enjoy my books, the first one there is actually called Unsubscribe and it's about email anxiety. <laughs> and it gives you tips for email anxiety which I don't think you can be, have work-life balance if you have your emails going to your telephone, for example, um, and if you're ch continually checking them on the weekend. Uh, it's about unsubscribing, and it's about training the people that receive emails from you about what to expect. So if you keep answering them straight away, they'll expect you to respond straight away. But if you kind of train them, that'll take half a day or a day um, set up those expectations, but it's um, it's available as an ebook as well as um, paper as well, and I think it's really interesting. And I'm not sure if it was out of that book, but I think it was an average about 54 times a day people will check their emails. Just think of what you could do with the, achieving a bit more work-life balance if you weren't checking your emails quite so many times each day. There is actually an app lots of apps around that you can download onto your phone to actually figure out how many times you actually look at your phone, <laughs> um, which for some people could be really frightening. Uh, the Happiness Project I threw in because I just really love the book. Uh, she basically takes a different aspect of her life every month 
and tries and improves it. So one of them is decluttering, for example. So for a month, she just focuses on that one thing, which is mindful. Or another month, she focuses on a new hobby. Another month, it's a book, book group. Uh, it's just, it's a really nice book. It's easy to read, but I love the way she just does one thing per month. Doesn't try to overextend herself. And then the other two are highly recommended. Um, the Life Matters, creating a dynamic balance of work, family, time, and money. And then Deep Work is about focusing. It's all about focus and concentration. And Deep Work. So once again, being mindful, not multitasking, <coughs> focusing on the one thing. And that is the end of our presentation. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Um, oh, I have a good question. Uh, if we wanted to start doing the whole like five to ten minutes of meditation, is there a certain time of day that's best to do that? Or? Not really. It's whenever you can squeeze it in. Um, but often things like that are easier to do in the morning. Uh, so you've got more willpower for a start and your mind is clearer. If you think of willpower as a bucket, uh, when you've had a good night's sleep, the bucket of willpower is full. By the time you get to night, um, that bucket might be empty. So that's why you can stick to your diet during the day or go to the gym earlier in the day and at night time you stand in front of the fridge, open it and you eat everything in sight. Your bucket is empty until you've had another night's sleep. So probably morning. Yep. yep. So who was that? Robert Robert Wright. Robert Wright. Why Buddhism is true. Thank you. I've just noted that down. We can add that to the resources. Excellent. Anything else? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.